My name is Abeku Mumin, but I was born Christopher Howard. I was born in Meridian, Mississippi, 1970, November the 11th, 1970, and to Miss Judy Howard. However, I was actually raised by my great grandmother. Uh, we were raised as Seventh day Adventists. I never knew my father. I only knew that his name was, I never met my father. His name was uh, David Stone. And uh, I knew that he was in the military. However, I never met him in my life. So, like I said, we lived in the projects for quite some time, in the Smithfield projects for quite some time, up until I was about 15 years old when my grandmother died. When she died, um, my life began to kind of spiral out of control. I uh, took to the streets uh, to find out what life was all about and ultimately found myself incarcerated. So, uh, in and out of juvenile facilities, in and out of the county jail. Ultimately, I found myself in the prison, in penitentiary. And I spent about, for the first, first time, the first time I did about 15 months, 15, 16 months, the first time. And did not know anything about Islam or Al Islam, did not hear about it. However, the second time I went to prison, because I didn't learn anything while I was there, second time I went to prison, uh, that's when I got introduced to Al Islam. And while incarcerated, I began to uh, study Islam. It's kind of funny though, because my experience with coming into Al Islam was based on curiosity. I, uh, I heard them mention over the loudspeaker one Sunday morning, Islamic service. I had nothing to do while I was in prison, so I just simply went out just to see what it was, see what it was. I never heard of it before. So I just went out to see what it was all about. And I, the individual that was speaking, whom I later learned was the Imam, I never heard anybody talk like that before. I never heard anybody that confident before, that focused. So, I made him, made him a point to go speak with him. So I took the opportunity, I went and spoke with him, and we sat down for about two hours talking about my life. I talked to him for about two hours about my life. And he just listened. He basically just listened. So uh, from there, now, I had no inclination to accept Al Islam. I was just talking to him. And from there, I had the opportunity to go to a vocational program. And, but I had to move from one different location of the prison to another location. And it just so happens, the location they moved me in was right next to the Imam, right next to the gentleman that I was talking to. And that began my convert to Al-Islam. That began my introduction into the religion of Al-Islam, what a Muslim was about. So we became not so much a father, father figure to me, we became good friends. We became uh, constant associates, constant companions, like Sahabi, we became Sahabi. So, he began to introduce me to Islam. I began to study it, read the material that he would provide for me. We would talk about life. I would go out to the Islamic services that they had on Fridays and Sundays. And there was a guy in prison, he was a Palestinian. And his name was Sami Abu Rama. And one of the interesting things about him, he was the first militant that I ever met. But this gentleman had, and he was a militant too, because this gentleman had, had uh, a, prost a prosthetic leg, but he would, he would fight anybody that said anything negative about Islam. Anything negative about Islam, he wanted to fight, physically fight. I, I, at one point, I used to think that was, it was kind of cute, but 
I didn't know anything about his lungs either, but I just, I just thought it was kind of cute that this dude was he's kind of bold too. This Palestinian guy with one leg wanted to fight any, anybody that, that said anything negative about a Muslim or Islam. But anyway, me and, me and Sami Abu Rama, Abu, Sami Abu Rama became good friends. He actually taught me to understand that Islam wasn't something that you just wear. It wasn't clothes, it wasn't a kufi, it wasn't a thobe. I never forget it. He walked up to me one day and he asked me, he said, man, so what you know about Islam? We call five, we pray five times a day. We call the Adhan. So we say Islam is more than that. And he introduced me to the life of Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. There was a book back then it was real thick book too it was um, i can't remember the name of it but it was a thick yellow book covering and it was the history or the advent of the life of muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam and initially i was reluctant to read it because it was so thick so however i Begin to read it, and I did not want to put it down. I was really impressed with the life of Muhammad, sallallahu alaihi wasallam. I was really impressed. I was so impressed. Like I said, I, they called them I mean, and I decided to call, start calling myself I mean because I had some a lot of the similar characteristics. And. I studied that book. I cherished that book. Um, I looked at the life of Muhammad, and I and I knew that this was a sincere journey. Uh, I knew that this was a a journey that was divine, ordained by Allah to Ayla. And I began to strive to try to emulate the life or the example that he lived. And I say around 1993, 94, is when I took my Kalima Shahada, or, or the Kalima Shahada. I took the Kalima Shahada. And like I said, my name was Christopher Howard at the time. And as you know, we tried to identify ourselves with Islamic, Islamic names, Muslim names. So initially I took on the name Amin. And as a result uh, of identifying with Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam being called Amin growing up because he was considered trustworthy. My first name began was Amin, I mean Abeku. And I had the opportunity to actually legally change it. I've been striving to be a Muslim ever since 1993-94. So one day, Samuel Abu Rama wanted to begin to teach me how to call the Adhan and to recite the Al-Fatiha. So what we did was every, every slat, I had to recite one verse one, one verse of the Al-Fatiha. There were seven verses. I had to recite one verse of the Al-Fatiha for every salat. You know, there five, we prayed five times a day. So I would learn one verse. So at the end of the day, I had five verses that I learned and I had to repeat them. And then we'd come back for, for Dur. I had to repeat the first verse and the, learn the second verse. And then come back for Asa and repeat the first verse and the second verse, and learn a new verse, for an asa. So it was, it was, it was trying because you know it's a new language for me. But alhamdulillah, uh, he taught me the the al fatiha. He taught me how to call the adhan. I became the muezzin for the community and for the brotherhood while while we were incarcerated. So uh, that situation the was was quite quite favorable for me. Not only did he begin to teach me uh, 
certain tenets of the deen, like the five pillars of Islam, he began to teach me the articles of faith, began to learn about the articles of faith. Uh, he taught me about the month of Ramadan and the things that fasting and that it wasn't just simply abstaining from food and drink during the daylight hours. It also entails um, enjoining reading of Quran, um, giving, being more charitable, uh, making dhikr, it entails um, not arguing, not fussing and fighting, not cursing, uh, leaving the TV alone, not focusing on that, mo focus on reading Quran, on making salad, uh, uh, talking about al Islam, you know, making, for, seeking for Allah's forgiveness. Uh, we focused on that. So it was a, all, my education came from someone who grew up a Muslim, who was born a Muslim. And he really impressed me. I was sad to, at the time that I had to leave him but blessed because I had a chance to meet him. Um, so when they, uh, I had an opportunity to go to another facility and I began to get involved with the Muslim Brotherhood there. And we, we had to address issues with regards to leadership and stuff like that. So the brothers eventually uh, uh, selected me to be the imam of one of the largest institutions in, in the penal system and we, uh, we were able to, to encourage other brothers to come to the Dean. Uh, there was a very learning, a positive learning experience for me, having to spiritually be a spiritual advisor for men who were seeking divine guidance. It was challenging, however very rewarding. All praise be to Allah. A lot of the experiences I had while I was incarcerated provide me with a way to handle and address things even now while I'm, while I'm no longer in prison anymore. There are a lot of challenges out here for Muslims. There are a lot of tribulations that we can get caught up in. We can easily get distracted if we're not focusing. We're not asking a lot for, for taqwa, for guidance. We're not asking Allah to be regardful of him. We're not seeking Allah's forgiveness. Um, so my conversion to Islam with regards to former associates, uh, some of it went well, some of it didn't go so well. Uh, some guys, they didn't, they thought I was faking. Some of my former associates, former friends, uh, they were, as though, you know, whatever you want to do. I'm, uh, that's your life. Some guys took a sit back and see approach to see if I was sincere about it. Some guys associated me with being a black Muslim. So that had to be corrected, that I wasn't a part of the Nation of Al Islam. That's black nationalist views and other views that, were, that are not in accordance with the religion of Al Islam not the, the example or the teachings of Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and that Elijah Muhammad was not practicing the Quran but a black nationalist philosophy which I had to help clarify. So some guys today, they don't really care about me being a Muslim. They look at me as being who I once were. Some guys look at me as being, you know, you're trying to change your life, you're trying to, you know, stay focused, do, do what you have to do. Do you, as we say in the hood, do you. Um, so some people I have conversations with, some people I no longer communicate with, and that's okay. That's okay. That's okay. I don't really have any problem with that because, you know, at the end of the day, we all have to be accountable for what we do. And no matter how much difficulties I may face on the outside. I'm at peace on the inside. So alhamdulillah, I'm at peace on, on the inside. I'm content with the religion of Islam. I'm content with being a Muslim. Um, I enjoy uh, getting up in the morning, making salat. I, I enjoy um, fasting during the month of Ramadan. I enjoy being charitable with zakat. I want to make hajj. I enjoy 
seeing brothers and sisters go to Hodge and come back from Hodge and see pictures of it. I enjoy seeing that. That's a wonderful sight, inshallah. I have the opportunity to circumambulate the Kaaba seven times too. Uh, like I said, I might not come back. So <laughs> like my journey is a long way from being over, inshallah. Uh, the society is better because I accepted out Islam. And my relationship to it and its relationship to me is better. I haven't had any real negative experiences with people in society saying things or being disrespectful. I think I can recall only one time, and that was with my wife, and we were coming from, we were driving from Alabama, and we stopped at a gas station in West Virginia, and there was a gentleman, a Caucasian gentleman, and a young guy. And I understand, young guys, they are very easy to influence, and the media influences them a lot that Islam is a negative thing, a terrorist thing, which is far from the truth. So just so happens that he, he seen my wife, she was covered up in, a, in garb, and he hollered out, go back to where you came from. Well, unbeknown to him, we were. My wife is from Brooklyn. <laughs> so, so Brooklyn, New York. So we were going back from where we came from. So I thought it was funny. I didn't really, I didn't really look at it as being discourteous because I know ignorance, ignorance is, this is what it is, it's ignorance. So I didn't, I didn't feel, too disrespected by it. I just, he's misguided, and you can't act and act ignorant with another person because he's ignorant. You have to be in, in. You have to give a sense of enlightenment. You have to make sure that your behavior is not similar to the behavior of people who are who are low, so are uninformed or unaware. So um, I didn't feed off into it. Just kind of smile and giggle because he didn't know we we were we are in the country that we were born in, and we got in the car and came on to New York and laughed about it a little bit while we were in the car. Um, but other than that, I haven't had too many negative, I haven't had any negative experiences, as a matter of fact, uh, unbeknown to me, unless they talk about me and I don't see them. But other than that, oh my, it's, it hasn't been a bad thing. It's been a good thing. So I think the Muslims are at a crossroads. I, I, think, I think our leaders and I'm not a scholar or a learned person. I just love the life of Muhammad. And I, and I love, I love the way of life of Islam. And the little bit of knowledge that I do have, I know we can't fit it in with secular society. It won't work. We have to strive to be Muslims 100% as best we can. And, so I stayed in prison until 2007. So I did from 1991 until 2007, approximately about 16 years. I did. I got introduced to Addis, like I said, I got introduced to Addis Islam while I was incarcerated. And when I got out, I was in Birmingham, Alabama, and I decided that, you know what? I no longer wanted to live in Alabama. So the day that I got out of prison is the day that I migrated or moved to New York. And I moved up here with my mother for a period of time and I found out that my mother was partially paralyzed. She had a stroke back in 2006. So uh, I had to take care of my mother for a while. Uh, still do. So I'm, I'm very, I'm very glad that Allah gave me, uh, exposed me to Islam.